Released back in 2016, the now-retired LEGO Technic Porsche GT3 RS marked the beginning of a new breed of LEGO supercars. A complex and comprehensive build with functional steering and gearbox. Weighing in at just under 2.5 kilos, it is a little disappointing that the key features are hidden under the panels. It seems to me that there's no reason to have all this functioning intricate engineering when it cannot be seen, but saying that, it made for an incredibly technical yet satisfying build. So LEGO took what they learnt a step further and in 2018 released this, the LEGO Technic Bugatti Chiron. The beauty of this set starts from the box itself. Weighing in at 6 kilograms alone, the unboxing experience is something special. Inside we find four custom Lego wheels carefully arranged on the left, and these do look really nice just like the real thing, while five beautifully printed smaller boxes with two instructional manuals are carefully arranged on the right. The two half inch thick manuals can be a bit cumbersome to keep open, but they definitely an improvement from the Porsche's single manual. Together they carry you through 970 steps across 628 pages. The first 20 or so pages are dedicated to a brief story of how LEGO's Technic designers worked with Bugatti's Director of Design and Head of Tradition to translate the life-size model into LEGO bricks, punctuated by high quality photographs of the LEGO and real car. And the build itself pretty much follows the same principle and same manufacturing process as the real thing. Box 1 contains parts for the engine and gearbox, which is, as you'd expect, the most complex and challenging part of the build. You will not want to make a mistake here, otherwise you'll be disassembling the whole thing and starting from scratch. So, bag 1 results in a sturdy frame upon which the car will be assembled. We also get to build the support structure for two of the four wheels this early in the build, complete with brake discs, which are a new element for this set. Each disc is secured to the arm with working suspension springs, which are a lot stiffer this time round in order to hold the weight of the completed build, while in between we find the rear centre differential, which came together to perfection and really works quite well. So far, so good. In bag 2 we build a very dense assembly which includes the gear shifting mechanism. The mechanism is cleverly designed, with a new rotating gear shifter and cross hole, which is used to change the position of two driving rings at once. The new part really stands out, since it is one of the four parts in the entire set in bright orange. Some real care is required to ensure the gear shifter is installed correctly, with very clear illustrations in the instruction book helping you to get everything aligned correctly. It can be hard to fix an error at this stage if you discover it at the end of the build process. At the end of bag 2 we get to attach the shifting mechanism to the frame we built in bag 1. Take a good look at the gearbox at this point of the build because you won't see much of it again because the engine is mounted directly above it, and that comes with bag 3. So bag 3 is dedicated to the assembly of the massive W16 engine, featuring alternating pistons which fire when the vehicle is in motion. As is the case with many other large Technic sets, the engine block mimics the function of the real thing. But the completed set is not motorised, so will only turn with the wheels as the final vehicle is pushed. With so many little parts, care is required on this step to ensure that all of the pistons are attached correctly and seated in their respective Technic engine cylinders. It's impressive to see how easily this large engine block assembly slides into the growing vehicle assembly, building up on the structure, and we can rotate to ensure the engine block is still free running. As stated, this isn't a motorised set, but it's great to see the level of detail the guys in the LEGO Technic team went into in order to develop the intricate parts of this set. Nevertheless, that brings us to the end of Box 1. Box 2 contains the next three bags of parts, so bags 4 to 6. Here we begin to build up the front end of the vehicle. So starting with bag 4, which is all about the support structure, the front axle and differential, and the part of the drivetrain which will connect with the rear of the vehicle that we've already constructed. Finally, we have the front spring suspension set up, again stiffer than the Porsche, so should hold the weight of the vehicle quite well. So plenty of progress in this one bag, with the front half already coming together nicely. The paddle shifter mechanism is introduced in bag 5, with a clever ratcheting system created by a pair of rubber band tensioned black angled axle connectors pushing against a gear filled with white pin connectors. This allows each pull of the levers to turn the gear one quarter turn with a satisfying clunk. 
This in turn rotates the yellow knob wheel, which ties via the gearbox and a complex series of other gears back into the transmission. Very ingenious. We also build up more of the front end, including the steering link. Another ingenious mechanism using cogs and shafts to link around bends and drive the final cog, which turns the front wheels. Nice and smooth. Finally, a bit of the cockpit and shell are added to the front assembly, introducing the first of many of the Chiron's dark blue elements. At the end of box 2 with bag 6, we continue to build up the shell around the front end before we get to the marriage process. This is a difficult step, requiring precise alignment of the elements as four different drive shafts span the front and rear sections, traversing between the gearbox and transmission, along with numerous other pins and connectors. Once complete, the build at last begins to take the rudimentary shape of a car. At this point, it's worth having a look at the bottom of the car too. A criticism of the Porsche was that the gearbox and engine were not visible at all on the finished model. That's almost the case here because the engine is above the gearbox, but there is still at least a gap in the chassis through which you can see some of the gear movement. Moving on, in the third box, the build process transitions from structure and function to exterior detailing. The car literally begins to take shape across these two bags. In bag 7, we focus on the roof and sides. The two most compelling additions in this step are the exterior bodywork around the massive engine, as well as the wheel well surrounds. In bag 8, we turn our focus to the rear of the car, which incorporates a rear wing that automatically raises an angles to provide downforce or braking power. The back end looks fantastic. The single strip of red light across the back has been cleverly replicated using a red flex tube held in place at the ends by stud shooters. A nice end result. Moving on to box 4, we focus on interior design, working from the back to the front. This starts with bag 9 where you painstakingly build not one, but two nearly identical comfortable looking seats. They are built using a mix of Technic elements and system plates and tiles, coming together really nicely and in comparison to the Porsche, these look much more luxurious. We also add some additional panelling to the exterior to fill out more of the gaps and finish off the rear half of the vehicle, introducing some of the lighter coloured panels that will eventually span to the front end. With a few final touches to the rear, complementing the curves nicely, it's really all starting to come together at this stage. Well, for the rear end anyways. Bag 10 involves a lot of invisible structural elements. That said, the most satisfying step is when you attach the steering wheel and dashboard. While I don't really think much of stickers, they do give the finished model a sense of realism that isn't possible using bricks alone, even though I would have preferred if they used printed bricks instead. We also attach the front wheel surrounds, while steering is of course facilitated through the steering wheel, and the gear shifters sit below it. There's not much leg room as a result, but that's part of the package with these Technic sets. Since almost everything else is done at this point, box 5 is all about the front half of the vehicle exterior. Bag 11 is where you assemble the doors and strengthen the front end in preparation for final sculptural detailing. So the front end really starts to take shape here, while structural support is added to the front in preparation for the panels to be installed. Adding the doors is a very satisfying step as it gives a fantastic almost there feeling and it adds another interactive feature of the finished model. Bag 12 is a large bag with a lot of parts. During this bag we nearly finish the exterior, including the hood on the front which opens and closes and the front fenders and air intakes. This is another satisfying step of the process as you nearly complete the vehicle exterior. Bag 13 is a quick conclusion to this massive undertaking. There isn't much left to add in the final bag, just a few sections of bent flex tube around the doors, rear view mirrors and a few other details. This final bag also contains the few remaining finishing touches like the A-pillars, the two-stage turbochargers, along with the car's few accessories. Of course, the very last step in assembling the car is the addition of the four wheels. The dark blue rims themselves are extraordinarily deep at just shy of six studs and are eight studs in diameter. They feature silver printing on the outside, making the five petal flower, and have a single stud in the center, which is filled with the printed one by one round tile with the stylized B logo. You might think that's the end of the project, but you will still have about 50 pieces left, which are used to build the speed key part, which is used to raise and lower the rear spoiler. It's a neat touch, but to be honest, it's a lot of faffing about, and it's much easier just to lift it by hand. 
And finally, the signature Bugatti branded dark tan travel bag, which sits neatly under the hood. And with that, the build is complete. I have to admit the Lego model captures the broad lines remarkably well, and the two-tone colour scheme is gorgeous. The curves around the tail lights are among the car's most elegant touches. As a whole, the model is resoundingly solid, easily picked up with a hand under the front of the roof. Gaps in the body panels are as much a part of the design language of Technic as pinholes and exposed axles. Nevertheless, there are a few gaps that stick out namely the gaps around the edges of the front wheel arch elements, both in front near the headlights and on top sloping into the hood. Both feel like they're missing a few elements to bridge the gaps, still it's a minor distraction among the overall beauty. Inside the car, the steering wheel turns the front wheels and the paddle shifter below the steering wheel rapidly flicks between gears. Of course, we have the gear shift in the center console too. For the most part then, Lego nailed it. The car looks unmistakably Bugatti, and unmistakably Lego Technic at the same time. The two-tone colour palette looks fantastic, and although there are only four mechanical functions, they work pretty well, even though they aren't that fun to play with, and the set as a whole is so large and complex to build that it has a fairly narrow audience. Saying that, if you own and love the Lego Technic Porsche GT3 RS, you need this car to be its companion in your collection if for no other reason than that the blue and orange colours complement each other so well. Both are premium sets of very high-end sports cards built in massive 1.8 scale. And it doesn't end there. Next in the set comes the super good-looking Lamborghini Sian, although that's a whole new project. 